China reports its fourth explosion in just one week, this time at a chemical plant. New military ambition from China. Party leader Xi Jinping is calling for new military equipment and weapons. That's part of his plan to build what he calls a world-class army. President Biden is committed to avoiding confrontation with China. That's according to his top Asia diplomat. He said Washington and Beijing should build confidence and be able to communicate in a crisis. An NBA star player is calling out Nike. The player accuses the sports brand of using slave labor in China. And a celebrity sex scandal rocks China's internet. But some suspect Beijing's propaganda system is fanning the flames and redirecting the public's attention from other crises. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. China news may seem chaotic. With so much information swirling in the news, we want to offer you a look at the bigger picture to help you make sense of the details. If you haven't already, use the link in the description box and subscribe to our China In Focus newsletter. On top of offering the highlights of what's going on, it also gives the much-needed context behind those stories. And once in a while, you'll also get a peek into some behind-the-scenes content to see what we're up to. Every Friday morning, the latest will land in your inbox. Another blast reported in China, this time at a chemical plant in the northern part of the country. According to official information, the explosion happened around 6 a.m. Tuesday morning. Its cause and casualties remain unknown. There's an explosion. Look, the doors and windows are all broken. Look, this is a passing by truck. Look at the glass. It's smashed. Don't know what happened to the driver. Several surrounding buildings were torn apart in the explosion, and roads in the area have been temporarily closed. According to official data, the chemical plant mainly produces resin raw materials and plastic additives. It's operated by a company called Ding Ding Chemical Technology. The blast follows a number of other accidental explosions in the country in recent days. A gas explosion struck northern city Dali on Sunday, killing two, while a different chemical plant blew up two days before that, killing four. And one day before that, another blast in Shenyang destroyed nearly an entire street, leaving five dead and nearly 50 injured. Due to the communist regime's tight grip on information flowing in and out of China, NTD cannot independently verify these casualties. Violence erupted in central China over the weekend. A man killed a village Communist Party chief and four of his family members with a knife. And then he killed two others as he fled. He jumped off a bridge as police tried to hunt him down on Monday. According to Chinese media reports, the suspect had visited the party chief's home on Sunday night and claimed to have some business to resolve. But the following day, the party chief and his wife were found dead at the scene, along with their daughter-in-law and two grandchildren. Another child was still breathing and was sent to the hospital. The police did not disclose the suspect's motives for the murders. But an official report from a few years ago says the party chief violated subsidy rules to wrongly compensate his own nephew. These murders come on the heels of another similar incident in China. Earlier this month, a man in southern China killed two of his neighbors. In that case, the public had mostly sympathized with the man's situation and his frustration leading up to the grievous acts. But not this time. Many people condemned the suspect online. Others said the cause should be addressed to stop it happening again. Incidents like these have happened before in China. Attacks are usually related to personal grievances or disputes. Experts tell Radio Free Asia that citizens and officials have long had strained relations due to the absence of a third party to mediate disputes or uphold justice. Chinese courts are usually reluctant to hear cases involving officials and ordinary citizens. And a lack of transparency usually ends with citizens losing their lawsuits. As a result, some people turn to extreme acts. A concerning number of people were infected with bird flu in China this year. Experts say the current strain appears to have become more infectious to people. This year alone, China reported 21 bird flu cases to the World Health Organization. It reported five cases last year. This year's H5N6 variant infected many people, some of whom became critically ill, and six have died. Earlier this year, the WHO said there are no confirmed cases of human-to-human -human transmission, but they are still calling for an urgent investigation into the risks. 
days after the WHO statement, an old lady was hospitalized with H5N6 in condition. That's according to an official statement from Hong Kong. China's CDC did not comment, but it did publish a study on its official website, saying the increasing genetic diversity of H5N6 poses a serious threat to human health, warning the cross-species transmission may cause a pandemic. Chinese authorities are ramping up information censorship in China, now taking aim at one of the last foreign news sources available to Chinese citizens. The Yahoo Finance app has been removed from Apple's App Store in China, though it's not known whether Apple or Yahoo itself was behind the move. The app is known to publish news sourced from media outlets abroad, some of which are banned in China, like Bloomberg and Reuters. That means those inside China were able to access media outside what's sanctioned by Beijing. The removal of the app comes after a slew of similar efforts by the Chinese regime, directed toward blocking Chinese citizens from accessing information from outside of China. The tactics range from issuing fewer passports to Chinese citizens to canceling foreign college exchange programs. The removal of the Yahoo News app tops a long list of banned media and apps in China, including the BBC, New York Times, Facebook, Twitter, Google and YouTube. An NBA star is calling on Nike to speak up about Beijing's human rights abuses. And Nike remains vocal about injustice here in America. But when it comes to China, Nike remains silent. Cantor is a player for basketball team the Boston Celtics. He's also an outspoken critic of Beijing's abuse of human rights. In a Twitter post, he accuses Nike of using Uyghur slave labor to make its shoes. Uyghurs are an ethnic minority in China, and they are mostly located in the country's western Xinjiang region. The U.S. says the Chinese regime is committing genocide against them, using mass detention, slave labor and forced sterilization. Nike said earlier that it doesn't source products from Xinjiang. However, Cantor challenges Nike in the video, saying they don't have the receipt to prove it. And DD has contacted Nike for comment. An NBA star again speaks up against China's human rights abuses, and the team is taking the heat on Chinese social media. The Celtics also have no plan to leave this lucrative market, which they have nurtured for a long time. The National Basketball Association is again facing tensions with Beijing. Boston Celtics center Ennis Cantor posted a video on Wednesday calling to free Tibet. Cantor called Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping a brutal dictator. Under the Chinese government's brutal rule, Tibetan people's basic rights and freedoms are non-existent. His comments drew immediate criticism from mainland China. On Chinese social media platform Weibo, demands for an apology and punishment for Cantor flooded into the Celtics' official page. The news puts the NBA in the hot seat, though the league has no apparent plans to step out of China's lucrative market. According to CNN Business in 2019, China made up at least 10 percent of the league's revenue, totaling about $8 billion. Some predict that figure may rise to 20 percent by 2030. NBA games first started broadcasting in China in 1989, arranged by David Stern, the commissioner of the National Basketball Association at the time. The league has spent lots of time and money nurturing the Chinese sports market. It's helped build basketball courts, given away broadcasting rights for free for almost a decade, and even brought celebrities and stars overseas for various games. And back in 1999, the NBA's first ever Chinese player, Wang Zhizhi, was picked in the NBA draft. More players from China were selected later, including Houston Rockets number one pick Yao Ming. Their participation has pushed NBA broadcasting in China from one peak to another. It's estimated that so far, China has around 330 million NBA fans. Statistics show the majority of them fall into the young to middle age group with good education and income. As for where the NBA is most popular inside China, Shanghai tops the list, followed by several more of the country's most economically advanced regions. The league has also adopted many new developments in the country in recent years. For one, it extended its exclusive digital partnership with Chinese tech giant Tencent in July 2019, a five-year deal worth $1.5 billion. That's an almost three times higher price than what the company paid five years ago. The league also features many of China's name brands in its partner list. And in China alone, 
tens of thousands of NBA-authorized product stores sell official merchandise. American sports writer Jack McCallum wrote 15 years ago that China presents a great conflict because it has colossal business potential and a terrible human rights record. The situation Cantor has faced following his support for Tibet seems to fall in line with that observation. Because of the communist regime's tightening of free speech and suppression, the NBA may now find itself in a delicate position. China is stepping up its military ambitions. On Tuesday, Communist Party leader Xi Jinping called for, quote, breaking new ground and developing weapons for China's armed forces. According to Chinese state media, Xi, who is also the country's supreme army commander, made the remarks at a military conference in Beijing. And another top military official at the conference urged efforts to build a world-class army. The U.S.'s top Indo-Pacific diplomat, Kurt Campbell, is shedding some light on Biden's China policy. In a virtual forum hosted by news outlet Nikkei Asia on Monday, Campbell said that Biden is determined to avoid a confrontation with communist China. He said the Biden administration remains committed to taking the necessary steps to ensure that competition does not veer towards confrontation. Campbell also emphasized the need for the U.S. to engage with China. He said it's necessary to ensure that the U.S.-China engagement serves the interests of other countries in the Indo-Pacific. At the forum, he also said it's critical for the U.S. to build confidence with communist China so that in a crisis, the two countries can talk to each other. Campbell is currently the White House coordinator for the Indo-Pacific Affairs. He was appointed to the position on the first day of the Biden administration. One of China's most famous musicians has been detained over prostitution charges, but an expert says the case is more than a simple scandal and that Beijing's propaganda system is using it for its own advantage. NTD's Juliet Song has more on that. Last week, a scandal rocked China's internet. Li Yundi, one of the country's most famous musicians, was detained. Authorities accused him of prostitution. The news inspired a lot of buzz on social media. The hashtag Li Yundi detained for prostitution has attracted over 3 billion views and over 300,000 comments. <laughs> Li is no ordinary musician. He shot into fame after winning the prestigious International Chopin Piano Competition when he was just 18 years old. Li became the youngest artist to win the prize and the first Chinese person ever to do it. In light of his arrest, some also suspect all the buzz behind Li's scandal isn't quite so simple. Some say Beijing's propaganda system is helping to fan the flames, something they claim is an effort to divert public attention away from bad news that could shake people's faith in the Communist Party's leadership. An expert says one of the signs fueling that suspicion comes from Beijing's state media. A number of state-controlled outlets appear to be launching an orchestrated campaign on Li's case. Before authorities officially broke the news of Li's arrest, Beijing police appeared to drop hints ahead of time. In a social media post that morning, police uploaded a photo of a piano, alongside a caption that reads, this world is not just black and white, but we must differentiate between black and white. This absolutely cannot be mistaken. About half an hour later, a local branch of Beijing police posted on social media, saying it had arrested a man and woman over allegations of prostitution. The post didn't mention the man's full name, but identified him as Li Di, without the middle part of his name. Later, Beijing's media mouthpiece People's Daily identified the man as Li Yundi in a social media post. Included was the hashtag Li Yundi detained for prostitution, which later went viral. Soon after, the prominent state media outlets such as People's Daily, Xinhua, and China Central Television launched a campaign against Li Yundi. The same day, People's Daily published a commentary criticizing Li. Beijing's state-controlled TV broadcaster soon followed, publishing another commentary around midnight. From the Chinese Communist Party's top mouthpiece to the bottom of the operation, Beijing is using its massive propaganda system to single out Li for a communist struggle session, meanwhile creating a hot topic for public discussion. Tang says the intense campaign from China's state media has an agenda. 
It's not the first time Beijing has used celebrity sex scandals to divert the public's attention. They have done it many times in the past, and there are quite a few cases like that. He listed one example. While Chinese citizens were buzzing about the death caused by the city of Zhengzhou's record flooding, Beijing police detained singer Chris Wu over rape accusations. Tang says right now Beijing's under pressure from shaken confidence in its leadership. Bad news reports are coming one after another. In finance, Evergrande, one of China's largest real estate developers, is on the brink of collapse. In the northern part of the country, a powerful gas explosion just killed at least three people in one city. And on top of that, the death of a Chinese fugitive has triggered public outcry over what's been called social injustice. Tan explains all the public attention on these news stories is not a good look for the Communist Party's leadership, and that Beijing needs another breaking news event to divert the public's opinion. He knows that Li is a perfect choice, since his fame extends globally, beyond China. As for Li, the scandal has taken a toll on his career. The Chinese Musicians Association already canceled Li's membership, while a variety show that he's involved with took down several episodes. Juliet Song, NTD News. In 2019, a handful of Chinese companies released more carbon dioxide than some nations' total emissions. And a new report says in 2020, greenhouse gas emissions hit a new global record. NTD's Don Ma has more. The world's greenhouse gas emission levels have hit a new record. A report by the UN World Meteorological Organization shows that carbon dioxide levels surged to 113 parts per million in 2020. The rate which greenhouse gases increased last year is faster than the average annual rate of increase for the past 10 years. Meanwhile, a report by Bloomberg shows a handful of Chinese companies contributed to the majority of carbon dioxide emissions for all of 2019. In some cases, one Chinese company released more CO2 than an entire nation's emissions. For example, the state-owned company China Baowu Steel Group emitted more carbon dioxide than Belgium and Austria combined at a massive 111 million metric tons of CO2. Another company, China Petroleum and Chemical Corporation, released CO2 emissions similar to that of Spain and Canada's combined. And China's electric power company, Hua Hong Power International, had emission levels equal to that of the United Kingdom. Carbon dioxide emissions not only contribute to environmental concerns, air pollution as an example, but it also contributes to health concerns. From 1990 to 2017, air pollution has led to around 5 million deaths each year globally according to an independent research center at the University of Washington. In an address to the United Nations General Assembly in September, CCP head Xi Jinping pledged to peak China's carbon emissions by 2030 and become carbon neutral by 2060. But observers expressed skepticism about whether China can deliver on that promise. Don Ma, NTD News. Swedish automaker Volvo is scaling back its stock market ambitions. That's after investors complain of its tight Chinese ownership. Automaker Volvo's stock market goals are seeing a setback. That's amid investor pressure about its Chinese ownership. The company originally planned to go public this Thursday and raise big money, $2.9 billion, by selling stocks to public investors. This process is called Initial Public Offering, or IPO. For a private company, an IPO is a big deal. But now, Volvo is making a change to its plans delaying its IPO to Friday while slashing its share prices, meaning it's now looking to raise $2.3 billion instead of $2.9 billion. The change of plans follows strong investor pressure. But what's behind it? Volvo is a Swedish carmaker but was bought out by a Chinese carmaker called Geely. After Volvo's IPO, Geely planned to sell about 20% of the shares it owns in Volvo, but also wanted to keep over the 90% of voting rights it holds in the company. This upset institutional investors in Stockholm. Because of that pressure from investors, Geely took a step back and agreed to relax its control of Volvo. Under the new plan, Geely will only hold on to over 80% of voting rights after the IPO process. China's top diplomat is calling on the U.S. to lift sanctions on the Taliban. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi made the comment Monday as Beijing and the Taliban held their first high-level meeting. He traveled to Doha to meet with top Taliban leaders. The United Nations says the Taliban is a terrorist group. 
After 9-11, the Taliban sheltered Osama bin Laden and refused to hand him over to the U.S. This August, the Taliban seized power of Afghanistan. After that, the U.S. slapped sanctions on Taliban members, freezing their assets in the U.S. and forbidding Americans from doing business with them. China was one of the first countries to establish contact with the Taliban after it took power. Two weeks before the Taliban captured Afghanistan, Wang Yi met with Taliban leaders in Tianjin. Now, during this visit, Wang pledges to help the Taliban, quote, rebuild the country. Wang will wrap up his Taliban visit on Tuesday. From there, he'll set out on a trip to other European countries, including Italy and Greece. Earlier today, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen spoke with China's top negotiator, Vice Premier Liu. Via video conference, the two sides discussed the Biden administration's economic plans and raised their respective concerns. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen had a virtual meeting with China's Vice Premier Liu He early Tuesday. According to a statement from China's Commerce Ministry, the two sides conducted pragmatic, candid, and constructive exchanges on the macroeconomic situation and bilateral cooperation, and agreed to strengthen communication on macroeconomic policies. The statement says China expressed concerns about U.S. tariffs and the fair treatment of Chinese companies. A readout later released by the U.S. Treasury also mentioned Yellen frankly raised issues of concern, though the documents didn't disclose any details. Liu has been leading negotiations for Beijing since the U.S.-China trade war began. Earlier this year, he held talks with both Yellen and U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai. This comes as the Biden administration continues criticizing Beijing over its human rights violations and seeks to rally other countries to form a united front against China. Tai pledged this month to exclude some Chinese imports from the tariffs as a way to pressure Beijing. That's on the grounds of its failure to meet commitments made in the Phase 1 trade deal. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.